Welcome back to the 12 ADCG Comprehensive Course. I'm Professor Adam Thompson and this is video number five. So we've talked about morphologies and intervals when it comes to the P wave. We've talked about morphologies and intervals when it comes to the QRS complex. Remember bundle branch blocks and LVH and all of that. Now let's talk about the T wave. Okay, and again, you got to start with a normal T wave. So a normal T wave should not be symmetrical. Okay, which means if you drew a line down the middle of it from the peak, okay, well, that's a horrible line. Let me do that again. All right, from the peak down the middle of it, all right, that's a little bit better. Uh, it shouldn't be the same on both sides. Okay, this side, let's call that side A, should not be exactly the same as side B. It should not be a mirrored image or symmetrical. Shouldn't be able to make an isosceles triangle if you're a geom geometry guy by uh, drawing a line there. Okay, if it is symmetrical, that means you have some sort of pathology. It's a pathological T wave. It doesn't mean it's an MI or ACS. It just means something occurred causing it to be abnormal. Additionally, the T wave should be upright in every lead except for maybe AVR. And the height should correlate with the QRS. So the bigger the QRS, the bigger your T wave, especially if it's in the opposite direction. And it should have a dull peak. It shouldn't be peaked you know, like this and sharp, okay? It should be dull on the top. So if you were to touch the top of it, you wouldn't prick your finger. So here again, uh, remember, asymmetrical is more normal, okay? Symmetrical T waves, if I drew a line down from the peak of these, they'd all be mirrored. Okay, so this one where you have that ST elevation, you're going to want to continue that down. Okay, they'd all be mirrored, or you'd be able to create an isosceles triangle, by closing off the bottom of them. Okay, so those are all some sort of pathological T wave. So probably one of the more commonly known pathologies that people kind of know you can identify by looking at T waves is hyperkalemia. All right, an increased potassium level uh, could be uh, seen on an EKG by interpreting the T waves, believe it or not, and uh, generally, the more classic finding is the tall, narrow, peaked T wave like you see here on the right. Okay, that's a good indication that somebody is hyperkalemic. It doesn't mean that they are, but it's an indication that they might be. Especially if they have a history of renal failure. Especially if they have a history of renal failure and they haven't had dialysis in a while. And why is that? Well, we know the T wave is part of repolarization and there's definitely a potassium shift during that time. So an increase in potassium causing an increase in that uh, that. Uh, polarity when you're looking at the action potential, the ventricular action potential, is going to cause that peak T wave. Additionally, if somebody has very severe hyperkalemia, they can have what we call a sine wave. And if you ever took trigonometry, you know a sine wave kind of, look across the top here, it looks like this if you put in sine in a graphing calculator and hit enter. But on an EKG, we kind of identify it as a straight line from the tip of the S wave or the nadir, that's called the nadir, N-A-D-I-R to the top or peak of the T wave, if you have a straight line there, like you do here, that's called a sine wave. And you can actually get that sine wave pattern that I drew up here as the hyperkalemia gets worse. That QRS widens, the P waves go away, it starts to look a lot more like a VTAC, but it'll be even wider than VTAC. That's an indication of hyperkalemia. Here's an example of a patient with hyperkalemia. This has been diagnosed. And uh, you can see these very tall, skinny, sharp, peaked T waves. And when I say sharp, just imagine touching the top of one of these uh, T waves. And you might actually prick your finger on them because they're so sharp, as Dr. Amal Matu says. So that's kind of a good indication that they're not normal. Um, and you may want to check the patient's potassium level. And here we have an example of a sine wave. Now this is severe hyperkalemia. This patient's potassium is very elevated and this is uh, close to being lethal. This patient might not live very long. Look how wide those QRS complexes are. That's much wider than any ventricular rhythm. Okay, so this patient has a severely high critical level of potassium and is at a uh, very high risk of going into cardiac arrest. Here's another 12 EDKG that uh, appears to have a sine wave pattern. Again, this is 
kind of fits your left bundle branch block pattern. You have a super ventricular wide rhythm, um, and you have a negative QRS complex in V1. You have that monomorphic or monophasic R wave in leads 1 V6. But you also have a straight line from the tip of the deer to the peak of the T wave and a patient with renal failure that hasn't had dialysis. So use the patient along with the 12 lead to make your diagnosis. Great thing about EKGs is every EKG comes with a patient. Make sure you assess your patient and don't just assess the monitor. And uh, by getting a good patient history, you might actually identify that this patient has an increased potassium level before you even run an electrolyte panel. Because if you're doing pre-hospital medicine, you don't have that you know, necessarily at your uh, disposal. So using an EKG might be the only way you can actually see changes in their electrolytes. T-wave discordance. I sort of mentioned this briefly uh, and when I was talking about LVH in the last video, but here's a better picture of it. Uh, whenever your terminal wave is negative and your T-wave is positive, or if your terminal wave is positive and your T-wave is negative, you have T-wave discordance. This is a normal finding in bundle branch blocks. And it actually can cause the ST segment to be dragged in the direction of the T wave. All right, so when you have a T wave discordance with a positive T wave, you might have a little bit of ST elevation or J point elevation. And when you have T wave discordance with a negative T wave, you might actually have a little bit of ST depression or J point depression. Here we have a patient with a right bundle branch block. Okay, um, and what you see is a positive. A terminal wave and a negative T wave. All right, that is normal T wave discordance. If that T wave was positive with the right bundle branch block and the ST segment was elevated, you'd probably be dealing with a myocardial infarction. So that would be abnormal, okay? That would be abnormal T wave concordance for a bundle branch block to have concordant T waves would be abnormal. I'll briefly explain the digitalis effect. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because digitalis really isn't that prevalent of a medication as it used to be. But all it really is is a scooped out appearance in that ST segment that you can see here, that arrow is pointing to it. So this scooped out appearance that can cause a little bit of ST depression is what they call the digitalis effect. It looks like somebody took an ice cream scooper and just scooped out that ST segment. Now let's spend a little time and talk about QT intervals. The QT interval is the interval that begins at the beginning of the Q wave or the beginning of the QRS complex and ends at the end of the T wave. So the QT interval includes everything from the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And it's an important thing to identify because a prolonged QT interval can cause lethal arrhythmias, such as to torsades the points because of R on T phenomenon, right? So you don't want a very long QT interval. It could be too short as well, but for, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we're going to talk about long QT intervals. And what we really want to identify is what we call the QTC, which is the C stands for corrected. It's the corrected QT interval. And the monitor will use something called Bazet's formula, so you don't have to memorize it. You don't even need to know the name of it. And that's what you're really looking at because a, a normal QT interval changes depending on the patient's heart rate. And what we call normal is anything less than 460, okay? That, that should be a good rule of thumb. And as you approach 500, so anything greater than 500, that's when someone's really at high risk for uh, lethal arrhythmias. So pay attention to the QT interval. And another reason to pay attention to it is if you're gonna be using uh, certain medications, it's a very common cause of the black box warning on, on medications, especially uh, antidysrhythmics. Uh, medications can actually prolong the QT interval. So you don't want to give somebody that has a borderline QT interval these medications that can prolong it because you can actually put them into a lethal arrhythmia. Here's that Bazette's formula I told you you didn't have to remember. Um, again, the monitor does it for you. Any modern day monitor, when you print out the 12 EKG, it's going to give you your uh, corrected QT interval and that's the one you're going to want to use. Here's an example of how it might print out. And what you see here is first it gives you the QT, and then it gives you the QTC, and it bases that on the ventricular rate, okay? And so when you look over here at your numbers, this first one, just ignore it. That's your QT, 
but this is what you want, is the QTC. And now you can kind of see why I've been speaking in milliseconds as opposed to seconds, because the 12 lead EKG monitors, when they print out their diagnostic values, it's almost always in milliseconds. So this 414 milliseconds is shorter than our 460, and that would be considered a normal QT interval. Different causes of a long QT interval, such as long QT syndrome, which could be congenital. Okay, it's a major contributor to the sudden unexplained death of kids. They think maybe it's a cause of SIDS. Of course, SIDS is a general term that they use uh, when they don't know uh, why an infant was um, has died. Uh, and, and one of the assumptions is, is possibly congenital long QT syndrome. And we know that young adults can actually have unexplained or uh, unexpected death due to long QT syndrome uh, when they go into torsades or even V-fib, or it could be drug-induced. We, we said that many medications can actually cause prolongation of the QT interval. So here's uh, 12 EDKG where the QT, it actually says, is 574 milliseconds. That would be pretty long. I think what it's also doing is it's, it's combining the U-wave here uh, into its interpretation. I just wanted to teach you a quick rule of thumb is if the T wave, let's pretend that that U wave is part of that T wave, right? So if the T wave, okay, ends past the halfway point between R waves, then that would probably be a long QT. It's a quick rule of thumb. It's not entirely accurate, but it's if, you, if you're just printing out a rhythm strip and you don't have your uh, diagnostics, that's a good rule of thumb, and then and then do a 12 lead and get the actual QTC. I mentioned the U wave, and you might have been wondering, what is a U wave? Uh, it's usually not visible. It, it's not prominent. It shouldn't be prominent. Uh, sometimes different electrolyte abnormalities can cause it to be more prominent, and it should never be bigger than the T wave. That would be some sort of abnormality or pathology. And they don't really know what causes the U wave. It's kind of uh, assumed that it's, uh, you know, repolarization of the ends of the Purkinje fibers. Next we have Osborne waves. Osborne waves, sometimes they're called J waves, and they indicate hypothermia. And as I said before, the best tool to identify hypothermia is not an EKG. It's going to be a thermometer, right? Luckily, every EKG comes with a patient. Use your patient and uh, use a thermometer to identify hypothermia not your EKG, but I'm going to go ahead and draw what it looks like. So if this is your QRS, an Osborne wave is a little hump right on the back of a QRS complex, uh, and that can occur with hypothermia. And it may be associated with bradycardia because, again, your hypothermic patients can become bradycardic, and it's an extra wave at the J point of the QRS, as I pointed out here. This might be a little bit better than my drawing, but it's pretty similar. Uh, that's what an Osborne wave kind of looks like. Now we talked about all the different types of pathologies that cause changes in your T-wave morphology. Let's talk about T-waves as it relates to an MI. Uh, with an MI, you could have hyperacute T-waves, inverted T-waves, even biphasic T-waves, or De Winters T-waves. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about that in later videos. But hyperacute... Um, just kind of give you one example, is a wide, tall, symmetrical T-wave, all right? Remember, symmetrical is never normal. It's always pathological. doesn't mean it's an MI, but it could be. It's tall, kind of like hyperkalemic T-waves, but it's not going to be as sharp on top. It's going to be like dull-pointed, and it's going to be much more broad-based, usually, than a hyperkalemic T-wave. An inverted T-wave, meaning upside down when it should be upright, typically an indication of some sort of ischemia. And DeWinter's T-waves are when you have J-point depression, where you, where you should usually have maybe a little bit of elevation. So it's kind of an abnormality, especially when you have these hyper-acute looking T-waves. We're going to get more into those uh, pathological T-waves that occur in the presence of MI in later videos. Um, but if you want to go back and watch any of the previous videos, click that left arrow over here. Uh, and if you want to go forward and move on to the next thing, click this arrow to the right. And don't forget to make sure you subscribe.